Right now on Morning News Now, unified front, President Biden and Zelensky praising NATO's unity in a face-to-face -face meeting after the Ukrainian leader blasted the alliance for delaying his efforts on membership. The changes some countries, including the U.S., are now demanding from Ukraine before it can join the alliance. Extreme weather overnight, multiple reported tornadoes touched down outside of Chicago, including near one of the world's busiest airports. We've got the latest on that. Plus, an unrelenting heat wave is now expanding coast to coast. We have full team coverage of the dangerous temperatures impacting millions this morning. On the line, the fate of the man convicted in the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history is now in the hands of a jury. We're digging into the arguments over whether or not Robert Bowers should face the death penalty and what comes next. And no deal. Major breaking news overnight. Hollywood actors are setting the stage for a possible strike after contract negotiations failed. We are breaking down the sticking points. That will have a huge impact, shows you would expect to see in the fall. We may not see till 2024. We'll dig oh into it a little Oh, my goodness. And the same time as the writer's strike. With the writers on strike. We haven't seen both them on strike since 1960. Ooh, Hollywood just shut down. Exactly wow. right. Good, good morning. Good to have you with us. We're not shut down. I'm Joe Fryer. <laughs> yeah, we will be here no matter what. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thank you very much for joining us. We begin our show with President Biden's final stop on his European tour following the culmination of that NATO meeting in Lithuania. This morning, the president is in Finland for the U.S. Nordic. Summit. He is expected to formally hail Finland's recent NATO membership and welcome Sweden ahead of its entry. Yesterday, the president wrapped up the NATO summit by holding talks with Ukraine's President Zelensky. That meeting came after Zelensky expressed frustration at NATO's refusal to offer a timetable for Ukraine's membership. Instead, NATO allies pledged their long term support to Kyiv. Speaking after the summit, President Biden said the military alliance was stronger than ever. When Putin and his craven lust for land and power unleashed his brutal war on Ukraine. He was betting NATO would break apart. He was betting NATO would break. He thought our unity would shatter at the first testing. He thought Democratic leaders would be weak. But he thought wrong. We got a team standing by to discuss all this. In a few moments, we'll speak with former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor. But first, let's check in with Monica Alba, who's in Helsinki, and Kelly Kobiea, who is in Kyiv. Monica, let's start with you. This U.S. Nordic summit is happening this morning. What can we expect from that? And then what came out of President Biden's meeting with the Finnish president a little earlier? Well, it has certainly been a warm welcome for President Biden here in Finland, Joe, and he will be celebrating and marking the fact that Finland was able to join NATO with record speed, the fastest member that has ever been able to join this critical alliance. And so the two leaders today in their meeting and face to face certainly touted that progress, continued to talk about how NATO is stronger than ever in the face of this Russian aggression. And we are here in Helsinki. And Finland, of course, shares a very long border with Russia and before the invasion of Ukraine had had some pretty friendly relationship with the country. So it was incredibly significant that they applied for that NATO membership and then were able to join. So certainly you will see a lot of talk about that here today. And of course, we have to note the incredible political contrast when you think about what was happening here in Helsinki five years ago to the week when former President Trump was meeting with President President Putin and where, of course, he famously said that he believed President Putin when it came to his denials about Russian election interference. So expect President Biden to also make crystal clear that the circumstances and stakes couldn't be more different here today in Helsinki than it was. And I think you can expect him to continue to clearly send that message here, Joe. So, Kelly, all these leaders are talking about Ukraine. Meanwhile, you're in Ukraine where the fighting continues. We understand there was another drone attack on Kiev overnight. What can you tell us about that? That's right. For the third night in a row, air raid sirens went off uh, last night in the early morning hours this time, about 1.30 in the morning. And you could actually hear and see the Ukrainian air defenses intercepting these drones and missiles. The Ukrainian military said that they shot down 20 drones and two missiles overnight and the falling debris injured four and damaged a couple of homes. But yeah, the third night in a row uh, for a 
drone attack here on, in the Capitol. Meantime, we're getting some new information about what the conditions may be like on the ground uh, in Russian-occupied territory for the Russian troops. Uh, Russian MP uh, overnight released an audio message purported to be from a prominent Russian general in which this general talks about uh, problems with equipment, with resources, with the morale of his troops, describing them as exhausted and not having enough reserves to come in and replace them. Now, we haven't been able to independently authenticate this audio message, but if true, it shows a real uh, problem with morale and equipment and, again, personnel in the field on the front lines in the south of this country for the Russians and potentially a split among top military uh, within Russia, leadership on, in the field and back in Moscow. Joe. So, Monica, we know President Zelensky was incredibly disappointed Ukraine wasn't offered a timeline for a NATO invite. How much of an issue was that during their talks yesterday with President Biden? Yeah, President Zelensky certainly came into the NATO summit quite disappointed and frustrated. But over the course of about 24 hours, he did shift that tone and instead really did express a lot of gratitude to NATO leaders here who had come together certainly to continue to support Ukraine and who had pledged so much of that weaponry and continued assistance. But yes, President Zelensky did want to see something in a shorter term, though in the end, the takeaway was that he was satisfied with some of the longer term security agreements that came from it. And here's a little more from what President Biden had to say yesterday in Lithuania about how their lengthy meeting went. The one thing Zelensky understands now is that whether or not he's in NATO now is not relevant as long as he has the commitments that, remember my talking about saying we treat it like guarantee security along with a number of other NATO countries as it relates to how we deal with, for example, Israel, long term. So he's not concerned about that now. And President Zelensky was also very grateful to Americans and specifically to President Biden for those controversial cluster munitions that the U.S. is now also sending to Ukraine. Joe. And Kelly, we just heard President Biden's take on what happened at NATO. Quickly, I want to ask you, how is Zelensky reflecting on this NATO summit? Yeah, so the quote that really stands out was that he said that it was not ideal, but it was good. Uh, and I think that sums it up. The Ukraine was concerned about long-term support from NATO allies. Uh, he, some of those concerns were assuaged by that G7 uh, security guarantee. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in terms of what he can bring back to his people, his soldiers on the ground who continue to fight, are these assurances from the G7 that they're in it for the long haul, that they will have the resources they need, military equipment, economic resources, and resources to rebuild uh, going forward? Joe. All right, Monica and Kelly, thank you both. Appreciate it. Let's now bring in Bill Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and a friend of the show. Ambassador Taylor, good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. So as we mentioned, President Biden's taking part in this U.S. Nordic Leader Summit later this morning. He will hold a joint press conference with the president of Finland following their bilateral meeting. This isn't something we talk about so much. So just explain to us, put in context the importance of the relationship between the U.S. and Finland. So, Savannah, this is a very interesting trip for uh, for a president, for our president. Uh, that is uh, often, in fact, is most of the time when presidents have gone to Finland, to Helsinki, it's been for some other reason. It's to have a summit with somebody else, maybe a Soviet or a Russian, um, or it's en route from back and forth. But no, this is, uh, President Biden is in Helsinki for Finland. Um, and this is a very big deal for the Finns. Uh, the Finns have a lot of experience, uh, relevant experience for NATO and for Ukraine. As we remember, 80 years ago, the Russia, the Soviets um, attacked uh, Finland, and uh, the Finns defended themselves very well. So all to say that there's a great relationship between both Finland and Ukraine and Finland and the United States. Absolutely. Also now, let's talk about this conversation, what we've heard from President Biden after meeting with President Zelensky. He gave this speech just hours after that meeting. What were some of your takeaways from his remarks? Strong support for Ukraine. Uh, 
uh, the, the one thing that President Zelensky can go home with is the recognition and the satisfaction, really, that the NATO summit focused on his country, focused on his victory. Uh, yes, he didn't get a concrete invitation to join NATO right now. That was never on the cards. But he clearly got the message that Ukraine's going to be in NATO. He clearly got the message that there's a short-term support for all of the work that all of the fighting that his troops are doing, but it's also a long-term commitment. So President Zelensky got a strong indication that, that the United States and NATO and the West is, is there with him until victory. So, Ambassador, it's been also, though, this long time coming, really, for Ukraine joining. It's been more than 15 years since NATO first promised Ukraine membership here. Uh, several countries, as you can see on your screen right now, you know, announce these new commitments, of course, but this is still, as you point out, not yet this full membership. How much of an impact does the outcome of the war in Ukraine ultimately have on the shape of NATO as we essentially wait for that event to find some type of culmination in order for Ukraine to be able to join. Absolutely right, Savannah. Um, Ukraine will not join the alliance formally um, until, as the Ukrainians say, until the victory, un until the war is over. Um, that will be the time then for Ukraine to join. Until then, they will be using the NATO weapons. They'll be taking advantage of the NATO intelligence. Um, so they will be effectively a part of NATO, but formally will not join until as they say, until the victory. So that's an important thing for the, the uh, Ukrainians to understand and to fight for. That's a motivation mm. for them to, to uh, uh, go for that victory. Ambassador Taylor, as always, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Savannah. Now let's get to another big story. Extreme weather across the country this morning. They are cleaning up in Chicago after some severe weather moved through overnight. Multiple reported tornadoes touched down in the area, including one at Chicago O'Hare Airport. The storms left behind a lot of damage. Large trees snapped in half, cars with smashed windows, and homes with damaged roofs. And then there's the ongoing heat wave that has been scorching southern states and is now expanding into other parts of the country. More than 80 million people are waiting Waking up to heat alerts this morning from California all the way to Florida and north into Kansas and Missouri. In cities like Phoenix, resources to help people keep cool are being stretched thin. Heat relief centers are seeing a surge in visits, as you'd expect, and city officials are making sure those who are homeless have help getting the supplies they need and finding shelter. And in Vermont, they are facing the daunting task. Look at these pictures of cleaning up after the devastating flooding we saw there earlier this week. Governor Phil Scott, FEMA officials, and members of Congress visited the region to assess the damage left behind. We are covering this all across the whole country this morning. We're going to get started with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman for your forecast. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And we are so, so busy still in the weather department. We're looking at that heat continuing. It's going to continue for days and days. No relief in sight. We're also looking at the chance for severe storms in the middle of the country and then unfortunately in the northeast New England in the same spots that were hit hard earlier this week. Let's first start with the heat because we're looking at 84 million people impacted. Look how far wide these alerts stretch from the Pacific Northwest into the Southwest, the South Central States, also the Southeast. So many spots soaring into the triple digits once again in the Southeast. If you're not in the triple digits, you're going to feel like it once we factor in that humidity. So that dangerous, unrelenting heat does continue and lots of pink on the map that's indicating that really hot air in place. And look at these numbers. 113 in Phoenix at 7 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. 115 in Palm Springs, Tucson, 106, 109 in Las Vegas. Those triple digits continue and continue. And then as we go throughout the south central states, we're looking at Amarillo, 99 degrees. That's eight degrees above what is typical for this time of year. That's today. Then we look towards tomorrow. This is Friday. We're looking at Las Vegas, 111, 103 in Fresno, 118 in Palm Desert, Phoenix, 115. You get the idea. We're going to keep these really hot temperatures in place. We have that heat dome that's just tacked in place. It's not budging and it's not going to budge as we go throughout the next week or so. Albuquerque 104 tomorrow, 12 degrees about what is typical for, for this time of year. And then look as we look towards the weekend. We're looking at Phoenix 116 by Monday. Same story in Albuquerque back into the triple digits by Monday. El Paso 104 on Sunday and 106 on Monday. It's not just the southwest. It's not just the south central states that are baking. We're looking at the southeast as well, and it goes all the way up the east coast too. So New York City today, 91 degrees. That's above average. You factor in the humidity. It's going to feel like 95. It's going to feel like 100 in Norfolk, feeling like 97 
in Myrtle Beach and 104 in Tampa. So that's going to continue to be a big story. Then we are also looking at this wavy cold front that's draped across the country. And we are looking at the chance for severe storms. So we're looking at severe storms in the central plains. We could see some really gusty winds, winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. Could see some large hail, baseball size hail, also a tornado too. But notice severe storms kind of stamped there in the Ohio Valley, also portions of the Northeast. Heavy rain is expected in parts of New England, also in parts of Northeast, uh, interior parts of the Northeast. So we're talking Vermont, Eastern New York, where we had those flooding conditions earlier, finally recover. Unfortunately, we're going to see one, two, three, even up to five inches of rain in some spots. And we're going to see some thunderstorms developing. That's going to drop the rain. So we do have flood alerts a stretch across portions of the Great Lakes into the Northeast New England. And this is a story not not only today, but also tomorrow into the weekend and look at all these bright colors. That is telling us that we're going to we're expecting a lot of rain in these spots locally five inches. And that's going to be a concern because the grounds are so saturated. The rivers are high. The streams are high. The creeks are high. So any additional rain is going to be runoff. And where you see that pink there, that's a moderate risk for some flash flooding. So it's mm. not just a flooding. It's flash flooding. And these people are just recovering. It's yes. warm there. And we're going to see that happen all over again. Oh, it's mm. a broken record. And now, Same it areas is. too or it's just been so dangerous. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Let's talk more about the dangerous heat. We're going to turn now to NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin, who is in Phoenix this morning. So Aaron, Phoenix has seen 13 straight days at or above 110 wow. degrees. I know it's early there right now, but what are conditions like? What have they been like since you got on the ground there? Yeah, Joe, it's around 4.15 in the morning here in Phoenix, and it's already 95 degrees. This is sweltering, and it's not just the high temps, but the sustained nature of this heat wave. It's just really hitting vulnerable communities especially hard. The homeless are hit hard. People living in mobile home communities as well. I was at one such community just a couple of days ago. A resident gave me a tour of her trailer. It was like an oven in Inside that trailer. She said that she was spending her summer huddled in the one tiny bedroom in the trailer that had AC. She told me that AC cost her $200 a month. She said it was breaking her budget, and that is at a discount rate. That is the reality facing thousands of people here in Phoenix and beyond as these warm, uh, these warm temperatures continue. Aaron, we mentioned just a moment ago city officials are making sure those without a home have the resources they need. How exactly are they doing that? Yeah, well, you know, these hot temperatures are no stranger to places like Phoenix. Residents are aware that there are a number of resources available to them, such as cooling centers, although we're hearing that many of those centers are already packed. We're also hearing from folks that transportation to those centers can be an issue. All of that, you know, creating what experts here are calling a crisis situation, which is why local authorities in Arizona are pushing for federal help. They want FEMA to declare extreme heat like what we're seeing right now, a, a, a disaster so they can unlock federal funds to help uh, help these communities get through this heat wave. And it's hard to believe this, Aaron, but temperatures could actually get even hotter there in coming days. Real quick, what is it people should know about the extreme heat risks? Uh, yeah, well, just experts say just know that it's dangerous. During the high heat hours during the day, make sure you stay inside. Hydration, super important. Drink that water. Also, be aware of those local resources that are in your community, such as cooling centers, to stay safe. All Joe. right. Aaron McLaughlin in Phoenix. Aaron, thank you so much. Well, a manhunt is on this morning for the driver of a car that killed one person and injured several others after being stopped by the Secret Service near the White House. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the story. Yeah, good day. We are right at 17th and Constitution here, the center of where all the tourists come to Washington. Right across the street is the National Mall, and that, of course, is the Washington Monument. This happened in the shadow of the monument, in that crosswalk right below the monument. The uniform division of the Secret Service was initiating a traffic stop because of a registration problem with the vehicle. But that vehicle suddenly took off, and it came this way, southbound on Constitution. In the process, it killed, or I should say it ran over three people, 
in the crosswalk, but one of those individuals was killed. A 75-year-old man who was taken to a local hospital. Two others were treated on the scene. Police described that vehicle as a blue 2006 Honda, again, last seen headed south on Constitution towards Virginia. This is a very, very busy part of the center of Washington. 32 million tourists every year come to the National Mall. 440,000 vehicles a day come through this area in the summer. And we are just about a block and a half away from the White House, which, of course, is the main tourist attraction in Washington. No indication that this was in any way related to an attempt on the executive branch or the president who is out of the country right now. Instead, it seems as if this was a criminal act, somebody running over tourists, uh, apparent tourists there in the crosswalk right here in downtown D.C. Back to you. Oh, wow, scary. All right, Tom Costello, thank you so much. Turning now to Pittsburgh, where jurors are deliberating whether the shooter in the 2018 attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue should re release, receive the death penalty. Robert Bowers was already found guilty on 63 charges, including 11 hate crimes resulting in death. This phase of his trial will determine if Bowers is eligible for the death penalty. During yesterday's closing arguments, prosecutors claimed Bowers has yet to show remorse for his actions and therefore should be deemed eligible. But the defense argued a history of mental health health issues should stop jurors from handing down a capital punishment. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now for more on this trial. Hey, Danny, good morning. What is the key argument here in this second phase of the trial? What are jurors considering while they're deliberating whether or not Bauer should receive the death penalty? This is all about aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The prosecution has to prove aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt, and the defense only has to prove mitigating circumstances, and that's anything positive about the defendant that should spare his life. They only need to prove that by a preponderance of the evidence. So the jurors are in there deliberating most likely about whether or not probably the mental illness evidence rises to the level of mitigating circumstances and whether or not the defense has proven that not beyond a reasonable doubt, but just by a preponderance of the evidence. That's 51% or 50.000001%. It's just more likely than not. So the rules are slanted in favor of life. But in a case like this, when the aggravating circumstances are so horrific, mm. uh, the prosecution has a good shot of meeting, meeting their burden. So, Danny, we've heard the defense argue Bowers carried out his attack because he suffers from schizophrenia. Prosecutors claim his mental status is irrelevant, saying he had formed his intent to kill months before the shooting. In this case, is mental illness enough to decide if someone should get the death penalty? What what is the standard here? Yes, but because we're at the penalty phase, mental illness doesn't play the role that most folks are used to seeing in a trial. Normally, they see mental illness as a defense, by reason of insanity, the person did not understand what they were doing was wrong and therefore they're not guilty or some variation of that. It varies a lot from state to state. But that's not what's happening here. That kind of defense is already over with. This case, the guilt phase of the case is over. The introduction of mental illness evidence in this case is really just a an attempt at mitigating circumstances by the defense. So this is not exonerating. This is not something that will uh, that excuse the crime. It's really just about deciding at the federal level whether we're going to have a death penalty or life, because life imprisonment will be the default. And uh, the jury's recommendation here, while the jury isn't required to find death, there's no mandatory death penalty ever, but if the jury recommends death, the judge must impose death. That's what the rules say. The judge has no discretion here. It is the jury that makes the final decision. So, Danny, we've been seeing this graphic on our screen that says phase one, phase two. What happens next, and, and does that outcome change based on what the jury decides here? Is there another phase to come? No. At this point, the jury will recommend one way or another. It's called a recommendation because ultimately in the federal system it is the judge that will essentially rubber stamp their determination. Uh, but the, the jury now is deliberating over simply whether aggravating circumstances outweigh mitigating circumstances, and ultimately they'll make a recommendation. If it is for death, then the judge is really just a rubber stamp. The judge just affirms what they, what they recommend and will impose death. And so the next phase, arguably after this, will simply be appeals, during which the defendant will be incarcerated no matter what. And that appeals process in the federal death penalty cases can take a very, very long time.
All right, Danny Civilos, thank you so much. Coming up, we are in the heat of the summer travel season, but more and more vacation rental homes are actually sitting empty. We're going to ask a travel expert what is behind that shift. But first, an NBC News exclusive. A top Air Force general shares his insights about whether the U.S. is ready for a possible war with China. Stay with us. We are back with an NBC News exclusive. Our Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby visited a military base in the U.S. territory of Guam for a rare look at preparations for a possible conflict with China. She also talked with the general who recently warned that a war with China is just two years away. Amid growing tensions with China, we're with American forces in the Pacific, where General Mike Minahan is preparing his airmen for a mission he's warned could come soon. Do you think the U.S. could be at war with China in the next few years? It's not me to say whether we could be at war with China in the next few years. Earlier this year, Minahan, the head of Air Mobility Command, wrote a controversial memo to his commanders warning the U.S. could be at war with China in two years and they need to be prepared. Do you still believe that? I don't believe conflict is inevitable. I don't believe it's unavoidable. Um, but I also believe that ready now is what matters most. There have already been flashpoints. This Chinese fighter jet recently buzzing an American surveillance plane and this Chinese warship crossing dangerously close to an American ship in the South China Sea. Minahan now preparing with Exercise Mobility Guardian. 70 aircraft and more than 3,000 airmen from seven countries, the largest readiness exercise in the command's history. Including this British cargo plane dropping off U.S. equipment, then simulating a medical evacuation. Also practicing resupplying bases in remote areas. Cargo door. Acknowledged. This mission to drop supplies to airmen establishing a base on a tiny island north of Guam. We're directly over the drop zone right now. About a dozen aircraft are beginning to drop their supplies and aid to the troops below. In his memo, Minahan told airmen to get ready by firing from a clip and to aim for the head. I'm not trying to be provocative. I'm trying to provide my formation with the tools and the action and the priority necessary to win. Do you still agree with everything you wrote in that January memo? I agree absolutely with the urgency and the action. Are you ready now? We are ready now. Courtney Kuby, NBC News. Let's stay on international headlines now. Clashes between Kenyan police and people protesting. The cost of living have now turned deadly. Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. At least uh, six people were shot and killed by officers during the protest in Kenya and several others had to be taken to hospital. Now in Nairobi, more than 50 children were treated after tear gas was thrown into their school by police. Human rights watchdogs have criticized the Kenyan police for their deadly response to such protests. The opposition leaders say they will continue rioting until the law imposing more taxes is repealed. <coughs> Now we go to China, who has just unveiled new details of its ambitious plan for a crude moon, for a crude moon landing by 2030. A China-manned space agency engineer revealed a plan to send two rockets, one carrying the spacecraft that will land on the surface and the other one transporting the astronauts. After docking, the Chinese astronauts will enter the lunar lander to descend onto the moon's surface, where they will collect samples and carry out scientific exploration. And we end up in Brazil, where archaeologists have found three giant sloth pendants that suggest people arrived in the Americas earlier than we thought. Researchers say the sloth bones show a deliberate craftsmanship that can only be done by human hands. These are thought to be between 25 and 27,000 27, years old. Uh, that is several thousand years before some earlier theories suggested about the first inhabitants of the Americas, guys. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Very cool. Coming up, a new warning this morning about climate change that is giving some people a sinking feeling. Literally, we will take a look at the unexpected impact researchers say it's having underneath our big cities. That's next. We are back now with new research published this week showing some impacts of climate change that you might not have heard about yet. The findings show that something called underground climate change could actually cause big cities to sink or at least impact their underground infrastructure. Dr. Alessandro Rotaloria joins us now. He is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Northwestern University. 
Dr. Laura is also the leader on this study, so of course that means he knows all the details here. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank um, you for so having me. So I understand that your findings came out of Chicago, but they could, it seems, apply to big cities anywhere. First, just tell us exactly what it found and what it could possibly mean for any of us living in these big cities. So, correct. Um, the, the study shows that the ground underneath Chicago is, uh, is moving, um, but this is also likely to characterize other cities worldwide, such as London, New York, um, all major cities, all urban areas worldwide. The reason for these uh, ground deformations that, as you said, can impact the function, uh, durability, and aesthetic requirements of civil structures and infrastructures is that um, we are in, we have in front of us a phenomenon called underground climate change that leads to rising rising temperature in the subsurface. Uh, these rising temperatures um, result from the fact that underground structures such as building basements, parking garages, subway tunnels, entry tunnels, and so on and so forth continuously reject heat in the ground, and soils, rocks, concrete, and general materials deform when subjected to temperature variations. And so this is the origin of this potential issue. So I, I also think it's really interesting, part of how you conducted this was putting sensors in these places, right, underground in Chicago. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, correct. So um, together with my group, we deployed a wireless temperature sensing network uh, in, in the loop, um, mostly in underground uh, structures, such as, again, basements, parking garages, and so on and so forth, to really measure the intensity of um, the heat sources that are driving this phenomenon. And then, so ultimately, if we live in these cities, what should this mean? What does this mean? I think about so many different things that we use in New York that are underground, whether it's basements, parking garages, the subway. Could these things be impacted? Either their function become uh, obsolete or is it dangerous? So um, it's, it's not dangerous, uh, but it's something that, again, can affect really the durability and aesthetic requirements of buildings. And, uh, and it's a phenomenon that uh, especially... I hope from now on should be considered in urban planning strategies um, and mitigated uh, because it can have effects and these effects are unwanted. So is there hope here? I mean, for somebody listening to this who thinks, oh, I mean, like you just said, it's really great to hear you say it's not necessarily dangerous. But what does this mean if we do live in one of these cities? Is this something scary we should be thinking about? So it's something we should be thinking about. Uh, it's not scary. So it's really the good news is that uh, we have in front of us uh, what I call a silent hazard. Uh, but the good news is that we have the knowledge and tools to mitigate it. Uh, for example, by um, retrofitting buildings and applying thermal insulation to minimize the amounts of waste heat that are rejecting the ground, or also by deploying uh, ground source impact systems and geothermal technologies to absorb at least part of that heat. So the good news is that there are very concrete and relatively straightforward solutions. And do you think that that's something that we will see cities implementing? Is somebody making these recommendations to big cities? I think so. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> and also, we could... have at least the, the the reasons for doing that. Yes. Right. Absolutely. What about smaller cities? Could they be impacted? Um, so, all urban areas will be impacted by this phenomenon to some extent. Of course, uh, smaller cities, um, like underground climate change in these smaller cities, will be less uh, significant and. Um, on a case by case is uh, potentially negligible. So uh, I think the main concern, the main potential concern characterizes uh, large cities worldwide, uh, especially in the in the older world. So in Europe, such as Rome, Paris, um, Milan, London, and so on and so forth. Dr. Alessandro Rodaloria, thank you so much for joining us. Really important work and great to be talking about it. Well, coming up, we've got more on that good news in the fight against inflation with prices now rising at the slowest pace in more than two years. We'll take a closer look at what's costing you less now and let you still have to spend more for That's up next. We're back now with a closer look at the good news we got yesterday about the economy. The latest data shows inflation is starting to cool, with prices rising 3% year over year. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung takes a closer look at what's costing you less now, but also where prices are still stubbornly high. From bacon and eggs, to gasoline, to airfares, to used cars, some things are getting cheaper. After the post-pandemic surge in prices, Further signs of improvement as the government reported that prices in June 
rose by 3% over the last year. We see that the pre-opening equity markets have rocketed higher. It's a significant improvement from exactly one year ago when inflation peaked at 9.1%. A part of the change, used car prices down more than 5% over the last year. Is this the best market for buyers that you've seen in the last three years? This is the best market for buyers. They're getting the, they're getting the most money for their dollar on the used car market, definitely. Outside Atlanta, Kevin Doring manages the Bellamy Strickland dealership. They're lowering prices to move cars off the lot. They've got more of them now. This is the lot 18 months ago, and this is the lot now. We've doubled our inventory in the last uh, probably four or five months. And it's not just used cars. Gasoline prices are down 26%. Airline fares are down 19%, and major appliance prices, they're down nearly 11%. There's a lot of positives really helping to push inflation down, but I don't think it's a signal at all of, of a recession right now. Markets close higher on the news as the rate of inflation is getting closer to the Federal Reserve's target of 2%. But challenges remain, in particular, for housing. The cost of shelter up nearly 8% over the last year. And just this week, a new report showed housing prices in May hit a new all-time high. This as mortgage rates hover around 7%. Interest rates remaining high on auto loans and credit cards too, thanks in part to the Federal Reserve, largely expected to again raise interest rates later this month. Brian Chung, NBC News, New York. More financial headlines now. The Federal Trade Commission is not giving up on its bid to stop Microsoft from closing its Activision Blizzard deal. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with that and some other news this morning. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. The Federal Trade Commission will appeal a judge's ruling giving Microsoft the green light for its $69 billion takeover of video game maker Activision Blizzard. The FTC has claimed the tie-up would hurt consumers and the video game industry. Microsoft has pledged to keep Activision's Call of Duty available on Sony's PlayStation console for 10 years and make it available for Nintendo Switch and some cloud gaming platforms. The deal faces a July 18th deadline to close and still must get regulatory approval in the UK. Meta is preparing to release a commercial version of its AI model, allowing businesses and startups to build custom software on top of the technology. The Financial Times reports the move will let Meta compete with OpenAI and Google, which are surging ahead in the race to develop generative AI. Meta has been working on AI research and development for more than a decade, but has been lagging the field after ChatGPT was released in November, spurring other big tech companies to launch similar products. And Krispy Kreme has a deal for its birthday. Tomorrow, the chain is giving customers the chance to grab a dozen original glazed donuts for just 86 cents with the purchase of any other dozen at regular price. Krispy Kreme was founded 86 years ago in 1937. Customers can get up to four dozen donuts with a deal when you buy in store. Online, customers are limited to just one dozen at the special price. If you want to access the offer online, you can use the code 86 years at checkout. I did look it up. A dozen glazed donuts is usually $17. So wow. this is a pretty good deal. Yeah, oh. it's a lot of donuts, though, so please share with other people. Don't, don't keep them all. 86 yourself. cents. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Pip. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. All right, well, just a month and a half left in the summer travel season. Many people already have their vacation plans set. I would hope so. But a growing number of rental homes in formerly popular hotspots are sitting unusual empty. Hmm. Mark Elwood is a travel expert and friend of the show. He joins us now with more. So what is behind this? It doesn't seem like fewer people are traveling. Is it that they're going to different places? Yes. What's the deal? See, I love it. I mean, you've teed me up beautifully. It's the classic thing of supply and demand. Money was very cheap, so people bought more homes, and we saw okay. a big influx of rentals onto Airbnb. 1.3 million on average available in America in hmm. 2022. Biggest number. Up 20% uh, on the previous year. But Americans are going overseas. The numbers mm. of Americans traveling overseas in Q1 this year, much higher than in 2019, which was about a year. So you're seeing supply and demand really out of whack. And I'm trying to think, remember early days of the pandemic, like the ultimate vacation oh was like going like an hour yeah, away to someone to else's home. You're yeah. like, oh, yeah. Absolutely. So <laughs> where are these deals to be found? Certain locations as well as where can you actually book them? I mean, look, you're going to see better prices if you do do a vacation home at the moment because exactly other people are going overseas. And mm -hmm. I would look at last minute bookings. The way we travel has really changed. You'll see that travel agents, travel specialists will consistently say that people are traveling much more on a whim. They're not 
booking six months ahead. Mm -hmm. So I'd look, if you really want to go to the shore and you think, gosh, I bet there's not going to be any availability, mm. I bet there'll be some last-minute deals. Huh. So if you are a traveler, it's good to have better choices, perhaps cheaper choices. Yeah. But I have to imagine sure. this is not good for the vacation rental market. Yeah, I was going to say, some people watching are thinking, <laughs> yeah. what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I have a rental home. Yeah. I think, look, it is going to stabilize the market. We saw a big influx of new owners for all the reasons we've talked about, the pandemic made renting someone's house incredibly desirable. We wanted that experience. I think we will see people pulling back and saying, gosh, I'm not making money out of this. Mm. I might do a long-term wow. tenant. And I think the market will stabilise. So bargains for a little while, and then I think it will, it will normalise. Airbnb is becoming a little bit more of a functional company. It, it made a profit in 2022. I think we're seeing it come to rest mm. where it was supposed to be. Yeah, it got a little crazy there when you were trying to be the renter. Um, is it Airbnb, VRBO, places like that that people should be looking? Where should you check for these deals? Absolutely. Look, I would always look on those platforms because remember, you do not want to go online to a random site right. and wire people money. <laughs> the reason you use VRBO and Airbnb is because they will guarantee all of the financial transactions. So look for the deals there. Awesome. All right. Mark, Mark Elwin. Elwin, thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank Pleasure. you. Great to see you as always. Coming up, we have got the latest on the breaking news overnight out of Hollywood. Yeah, the deadline has passed to avoid a major actor strike, and now that union is one step closer to walking off the job. We'll dig into what happens next and what it means for some of your favorite movies and TV shows. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, people excited about viewing two beautiful natural phenomena are going to have to wait a little longer. The northern lights, which were expected to be visible, look how beautiful that is, in more than a dozen states were mostly not seen, unfortunately. And Manhattan Henge didn't happen yesterday evening. That's what this picture is. Because it was cloudy, that is the phenomenon when the sun aligns itself perfectly with the Manhattan grid's east and west streets, making for a great photo. Well, the good news is that if you are in Manhattan at sunset today, you've got one more chance to to see that and our own Michelle Grossman said you should be able to see something in the 8 p.m. hour when it's only partly cloudy. Joe, I'm going to admit I lived in New York for like a decade now. I never really got this. I feel like a lot of times it looks that beautiful, but <laughs> this is like special. So I don't know. Maybe I'll go try to check it out. It's extra special. It's really interesting. The new Broadway musical New York, New York actually features that in a key moment, which is really cool. Oh, that is it feels cool. Like such a New York yeah. moment. It's right before our bedtime, the 8 p.m. hour, so we could check it out. We can try. All right. Let's, let's meet up and do that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Savannah. All right. Film and TV actors could be on the picket line by the end of the day today. The contract for SAG after the Actors Union expired at midnight, and the group was unable to reach an agreement with Hollywood's top studios. Overnight, the union's negotiating committee voted unanimously to strike. Later today, the union's national board will decide whether to order that strike. It is a decision that could effectively shut down Hollywood. This morning, no deal. Both sides announcing actors in Hollywood studios did not meet their midnight deadline for an agreement. This is the equivalent of pressing a button on a nuclear bomb in Hollywood. 160,000 actors could soon walk off the set, bringing Hollywood to an abrupt halt. The Actors Union saying the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, quote, remains unwilling to offer a fair deal. Well, the association representing the studio says it is deeply disappointed, adding, this is the union's choice, not ours. Over the past few months, dozens of A-list actors have hit the picket lines to show their support for striking WGA writers and spoken out on the red carpet. I believe in, uh, in, 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 uh, in unions, I believe in labor, I believe in representation. Well, the writer's strike has already halted production of most scripted shows. Without actors, many more films and TV shows would go dark. You're going to start to see significant layoffs throughout Hollywood because of this. Hollywood insiders say, well, money is at the root of the labor dispute. It's not the only sticking point. The Actors Union is also looking for more residuals for streaming content and protections against the use of AI-generated content in film and TV shows. This morning, the studios say they offered historic pay and residual increases and a groundbreaking AI proposal that protects actors' digital likenesses. But the Actors Union is calling the studio's proposals insulting and disrespectful. Overnight, the Oppenheimer stars weighing in at their London premiere. We got to get what we're worth and um, there's there's money being made and, and it needs to be allocated in a way that takes care of people who are who are on the margins. Guild President Fran Drescher told today last month they're prepared to hold out for a fair deal.
It's a very different industry, and uh, with streaming and digital, uh, it's really, really important that it become restructured to complement what it is now. We should mention that NBC Universal's parent company, Comcast, is part of the AMPTP. That's the Producers Alliance. Also, some members of the news division are members of the SAG after a union. By the way, the union is going to hold a press conference 3 p.m. Eastern mm. today to announce if that strike has been ordered. Lots to hear then this afternoon. Exactly. All right, nominations. We're going to talk about TV now. For the 75th Annual Primetime Emmy Awards were announced. Huge day for HBO with two of their shows taking the top two spots. However, with these two strikes going on in Hollywood, organizers aren't quite sure how the show will go on. Chris Witherspoon is an NBC entertainment contributor and founder of Pop Viewers, and he is joining us on set with all of the details we love in your hair. Chris, it's Good great morning. to see you. Crazy morning. Crazy Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, there's <laughs> too much going to cover. on. A little bit of entertainment news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I guess I let's start with the good news part of yes. this, Emmys. Who Tell us about who took most nominations. It was a really big uh, night or yesterday, a big morning for streamers. Succession got 27 nominations. It's our final season, fourth and final season, The Last of Us, 24 nominations. The White Lotus, my favorite show, uh, 23 Same. nominations. And then Ted Lasso also for their farewell season, 21 nominations. And Succession also made history. It's the first time that a series has three actors nominated for the lead actor wow. uh, category. So Brian Cox, Jeremy Strong, Kieran Culkin, and that show just took my breath away this season. Oh, yeah. yeah. Phenomenal. Oh, it was so good. It so really good. was. Oh, some of those episodes, so much drama. Oh, my God, so many twists and turns. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no spoiler, I can't give it away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I almost did. Well, hopefully you've seen it by yeah. now. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, things were ruined for me long ago, long so ago. if you haven't seen it, you already know what happens. So were there any surprises, maybe even some snubs in the yeah, list I think a big year? surprise is this show on Freebie called Jury Duty. A lot of folks haven't oh watched gosh, the show. This it's so hilarious, gosh. but that was nominated for Outstanding Comedy. Kind of reminds me of when the Shit's Creek a TV series kind of came from nowhere and began getting Emmy nominations. Also, some big snubs. Yellowstone, most watched show on TV, you guys, still has not been nominated for any major acting category. Or That's any major award for like drama. Me. It's so crazy. Also, Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford were snubbed. These icons in Hollywood snubbed for their show 1923. It's a prequel oh. series uh, to Yellowstone. Then also Poker Face and Steve Martin and Selena Gomez from the series uh, Only Murders in the Building yeah. were also snubbed. That's a little surprising. I mean, the, the Emmy voters just have something against Yellowstone. We did the story no, I, yeah. a year ago about how they got totally and snubbed. The crazy part, that is where the viewers are. People yeah. are watching this show, and it's actually very highbrow drama. Yeah. So very yeah. Yeah. Shocking. There's also, that's an interesting one because there's drama in the real world. Ooh, exactly. not Come just, on. Not just, not <laughs> just my water on yeah. that one. <laughs> Ooh, oh my gosh. All right, Ray Liotta, let's talk about yes. this emotional here. So, this show, Blackbird, phenomenal. So, limited series on Apple TV. Oh. If you haven't watched it, please watch so it. Good. He got a you posthumous, told me to watch that. Yeah, yeah a posthumous uh, outstanding best supporting actor nomination. He died last May, as you guys can all recall, an icon in TV. So, this should be huge for him. Oh. Yeah, and, and so well deserved. Yeah. I mean, oh I, goodness, we yeah. just said it here. You have to see Blackbird. It, it's already. Oh, oh my god. god. On the edge of my seat the on whole the edge time. of your seat. Yeah. Like yes. in a way that's like you're it's not like so scary the whole time like something's no. gonna jump out at you, but it's just like so well done. Brilliant acting. The prisoners yeah. are just like oh so brilliant. Yeah. yeah. All really right. Good. So we have to talk about the strike that's going on now because you can't. Oh, really what strike? Promote. Yeah, I know you can't promote <laughs> your films. Well, the strike. Could be asking which strike? Which strike? Oh, that is true. That <laughs> we is saw true. the Tonys had to deal with this. Yeah, they got a yeah. special permission, but there was no writing in the show. Yeah, Emmys yeah. are what mid September. What could the show look like? Yeah. So we might not have the show. I mean, I think that the show can't go on because to really show up, you have to be permitted to promote your your work. And right now, as an actor, you cannot promote your work. And that's part of what these Emmys are about, is campaigning for a month and a half to get in front of Emmy voters doing these special screenings, doing press for the Today Show, coming here and doing press, and you can't do that if the strike happens. And if you don't have the writers, if they're still on there strike, we go. then you It'll can't write the show that's going to be gonna put be on. Very awkward. And so that creates a lot of issues for Absolutely. that. And you said be. the last time that was the case was what? So the last time we've had both the writers and the actors on strike together, it was 1960. So the New York Times made a point. That's when Marilyn Monroe was in Oh, my God. And, and Ronald Reagan. Reagan was the president of SAG in 1960. Yeah. Which is also very interesting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So it's been more than 60 years. So it, it, it will bring Hollywood to a standstill mm -hmm. shows that we would expect to see this fall. Almost certainly oh, yeah. we're not going to see And billions of dollars year. lost in the economy in Los Angeles and also Atlanta, which is a huge hub. Yeah. Yeah, already billions have been lost. Huge so many seven people days. just without jobs, without paychecks. It's I pretty know. wild. All right. It should be crazy. Chris Weatherspoon, thank you very much. Lots to cover this morning. You did great. It's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news, of course, continues right now. Stay with us. <laughs> Thank you.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, support and solidarity. President Biden is in the newest NATO state of Finland this morning. He's attempting to further bolster the theme of unity that has been echoed throughout the alliance's summit this week. It comes after a productive meeting with Ukraine's President Zelensky yesterday as the war-torn nation seeks a firmer timeline for when it can join NATO. More on their discussion and what it could mean for the future of the war. A triple threat of extreme weather, a possible twister seen touching down near Chicago's O'Hare Airport, devastating floods forcing Northeasterners to pick up the pieces with even more rain on the way today. Plus, that unrelenting heat dome is now expanding, affecting millions of Americans this morning, and the calls for federal help are growing louder this morning. We've got team coverage on what you can expect as you head out the door. Also this morning, cautious optimism. We're going to bring you a closer look at how artificial intelligence is reshaping the world of modern medicine. Well, the advances are promising. The new tech won't be replacing your doctor anytime soon. And we are flipping the script this morning with a true triple threat. They are a writer, actor, and musician bringing gender fluidity into the spotlight. Looking forward to bringing you that conversation live. If you're a fan of the show Younger, mm. oh yes, the stars of that show. Oh, right I there. love that show. All right, we're going to begin awesome. this hour with the latest out of President Biden's European visit. Yeah, this morning the president is meeting with leaders of the Nordic countries in Finland. Earlier, the president sat down with his Finnish counterpart to formally welcome NATO's newest member. The trip comes on the heels of yesterday's meeting. You're seeing here on your screen with Ukraine's President Zelensky in Lithuania. The talks focused, of course, on long-term support to Ukraine in its war with Russia, but was overshadowed by tensions over Kyiv's path toward NATO membership. We will hear from defense priorities military expert Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis in just a few moments. But before that, let's get to NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander, who joins us from Helsinki. Hi, Peter. Good morning. Good day to you from here in Finland. President Biden is punctuating his European trip with today's stop in Helsinki, a victory lap of sorts, formally welcoming the 31st country into the NATO alliance after this week paving the way for Sweden's membership as well. Both countries, with their strong militaries, had avoid taking sides so as not to provoke Russia right next door. This morning, President Biden standing in solidarity with NATO's newest member, Finland, after celebrating a harsh rebuke to Russian President Vladimir Putin while celebrating the expanded strength of NATO. Putin still wrongly believes that he can outlast Ukraine. And even after all this time, Putin still doubts our staying power. He's still making a bad bet. <laughs> The U.S. is by far Ukraine's biggest backer, but President Biden is walking a fine line as he does not believe Ukraine should be admitted to join NATO until after the war. The president in the former Soviet state of Lithuania warning of a long fight for freedom. It follows a new round of attacks on Kyiv, where Ukraine's air defenses fended off what Ukrainian officials said were Iranian-made drones. Earlier, the president met with Ukraine's President Zelensky, who arrived at the summit expressing anger at NATO's refusal to set a concrete timeline for Ukraine's membership, but left seemingly satisfied by the leader's long-term security commitments. I think from the end of summit, we, we have great unity from our leaders. President Biden's facing criticism for the U.S.'s commitment to deliver Ukraine cluster bombs that are banned by more than 100 countries, including many NATO nations, because those weapons pose a threat to civilians. Zelensky defended the move. And I didn't hear from all the, you know, parts of the world when, when Russia began to use it. The stop comes almost five years to the day after former President Trump huddled with Putin here in Helsinki, saying he believed Putin's denials about Russia's election interference over the assessments of America's intelligence agencies. Not far from here, Russia is watching President Biden's trip closely, overnight responding to the NATO summit, accusing the leaders of, quote, Cold War schemes. President Biden heads home to Washington later today after holding a news conference here in Helsinki. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you so much. Let's bring in Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis now. Good to have you with us. So I want to start with some of the tensions we saw brewing between Ukraine and Western allies at yesterday's NATO meeting. We heard separately from Britain's defense secretary and the White House national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, that Ukraine ought to show more gratitude for the support it's getting. That appeared to be in response to the anger we saw expressed by President Zelensky over the lack of a timetable to join NATO. 
What do you make of those comments? Were you surprised they were made publicly? Yeah, I got to say, I was a little bit surprised that they were made publicly because they, behind the scenes in, in about the five to six days prior to this conference, many people at the highest levels in NATO uh, were working with Zelensky and his, uh, his administration to say, look, we're going to give you a lot of things. We're going to give you more weapons and ammunition, but there's not going to be a firm deadline given to you for an application to NATO. So don't come in and make a big issue because we're trying to show unity and, and we want togetherness. And, uh, and it looks like that Zelensky tried to play that at the last minute to try to change the term by trying to play on some of his star power that he's been having by making these claims that he wants a firm deadline and a firm date. And, and NATO is just not going to give in on that. And rightly so, because, look, there's no way that a country that is at war with a nuclear power is going to be given entry into a NATO with Article 5 guarantees. And, and he should have known that. And I, I don't think it was a good play for Zelensky. And, uh, and I think he was a bit uh, humbled by it, it looks like. We know Russia, of course, sees NATO's eastward expansion as an existential threat. I mean, do you think Ukraine should be admitted to NATO after the war is over? Is there any risk to global stability even doing it that? The United States has to be very clear out on this. We need to do everything in our power to keep our current alliance system safe and our country safe. The fact is that American interests are not synonymous with uh, Kiev's interests. And of course they want it, and it makes perfect sense that they want it in NATO. But I, our security would be put at more risk because of the Article 5 guarantees to a country that is very much antagonistic with its with its neighbor. So I don't think that whether this war is over now uh, or later, or that the uh, NATO administrator or entrance is going to be granted to, to Ukraine because the number one, they're not even going to qualify by our own standards of having all their internal disputes resolved. They've been at civil war for since 2014 and their border disputes resolved. So unless there's a complete peace between the two, then maybe you can talk about it. But that is so far in the future that it's just not rational in the near term. As we've been talking about all morning, President Biden is in Finland for the Nordic summit. What kind of role do you see that country playing as the newest NATO member and also Sweden as an incoming member? Yeah, militarily, they're, they're not, uh, you know, that big of a power. They have some capability, but in terms of the overall NATO military power, it doesn't really add a lot to it, but it does add a lot of political stability and, and it expands uh, the unity, you know, within Europe uh, towards NATO. So in that regard, it does strengthen the alliance uh, diplomatically and politically, but it doesn't do a lot militarily. And, and, you know, Biden's trying to do things to continue to advance American interests, especially in the Arctic and with some AI and some other issues that uh, are of mutual benefit up there. All right. Lieutenant Colonel Davis, as always, thanks for your expertise. We appreciate it. Out of the extreme weather across the country, first, that dangerous record-breaking heat that is now expanding across the West and the South. July on track to be the hottest month in U.S. history. People are sweating it out as those triple-digit temperatures drag on for another week. This morning, 81 million people are under heat alerts, and that heat dome is expanding with the extreme heat stretching all the way up to the Northeast now. In Vermont, though, folks there are anxiously watching those receding floodwaters. Although water levels are going down, a new round of rain could create more flooding, further complicating, of course, what could be a long road to recovery for communities. We have a team covering all this extreme weather for you this morning. We're going to begin with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman here in studio with us with the forecast. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there. And yeah, we're looking at a lot of big stories across the country, one being that heat dome still in place, bringing that dangerous record-breaking heat. We'll continue to do so because that heat dome is not budging. We're looking from the west to the south central states into the southeast, even up the east coast, we're really warm today. Then we have the flooding concerns, the severe risk. We have a wavy, wave front, wavy cold front that's from the northeast all the way to portions of the plains, the Rockies. We're looking at that heat and humidity combining with that cold front. That's going to trigger some storms. And some could be severe with really gusty winds, large hail, the chance for tornadoes. And then look what happens as we go throughout tomorrow. Nothing really changes. We're still stuck. We have that traffic jam in the atmosphere. So still really dangerous heat throughout the west into the south central states. Severe storms once again in the plains. And that flooding risk continues.
continues importance of New England, the Northeast, and also rain to the Southeast. So sort of a repeat performance. Same story on Saturday, heat wave back to the West, to the South Central states. Storms likely from the Midwest to the Tennessee Valley and to the Southeast, up through the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, New England once again. We're going to be soggy. We're so soggy in portions of New England where we had that flooding earlier this week. And then looking towards Sunday, the same story. Nothing changes over the next four days. Record highs still in the West and the South Central states. And still rain stuck from New England, the Mid-Atlantic, into portions of the Carolinas and also the Gulf Coast states, Gulf Coast states into the Southeast. So first, starting with the severe weather risk, because we're looking at the chance for really gusty winds. 22 million people at risk for winds over 65 miles per hour. Could see some damaging hail. Could be baseball-sized hail. That's going to cause damage on its own. The winds could bring down some power lines, also some trees. The likeliest spot would be where you see this yellow. That includes Burlington to Binghamton, Pittsburgh, down to Cincinnati, and just west of D.C. So D.C., you could see some strong thunderstorms later on today. Now, taking a look at radar, we do have some storms down to the south, but we're looking at this cluster here where we have some very heavy rain into the Great Lakes. This is just getting going. As we go throughout time here, we're going to see that wavy front kind of move a little bit, and we're going to see the trigger for some thunderstorms, and that could drop a lot of rain in a short amount of times. So we could see some flooding once again in those places that were hit hard earlier this week. That means any rain that falls, we could see one, two, three, even up to five inches of rain in some spots, has nowhere to go. The streams, the creeks, the rivers are so high, the ground is so saturated, so any any rain that falls will be some runoff. So here we do have some flood watches that includes portions of eastern uh, northeast, the Great Lakes, into portions of New England. And we're also looking at the chance for flash flooding. We don't typically see moderate risk. We had a high risk on Monday in portions of Vermont. We're going to see moderate risk today where you see that hot pink color. So parts of New York, parts of uh, Vermont and also New Hampshire, we're looking at rainfall rates of two inches or greater. And that's going to continue as we go throughout tomorrow. Remember, we're stuck in this pattern where we're going to see rainfall rates of up to an inch on those very saturated grounds. Rainfall mats, rainfall mounts, where you see these brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're looking at the chance for the heaviest rain. So again, one, two, three inches of rain, that's enough. But some thunderstorms could produce locally up to five inches of rain. And notice it's a lot of the northeast and the portions of the mid-Atlantic. That includes Philadelphia as well. We could see some airports interrupted, some roadways interrupted. Heat alerts, 84 million people at risk, stretching from the northwest to the southwest, the south central states into the southeast. Temperatures soaring once again into the triple digits, breaking records, dangerous, unrelenting heat. 115 in Palm Springs, 106 in Tucson, and 109 in Midland. Today, tomorrow, and also throughout. Really next week, and we can say beyond that, I'm sure. You say we're yeah. stuck in this pattern. We we're are. really stuck. We have been stuck for so yeah. long. Ugh. It just won't budge. It really won't. Michelle, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue our coverage of the extreme weather now with more on those dangerously high temperatures. Phoenix is just one of the cities baking in the heat. The city's temperature, it's already past 90 degrees this morning. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is there. No way! Overnight tornadoes touching down in Chicago. Dramatic funnels forming over the city. Look, at this. look, 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 look. Right here. Right, yep, right, right there. there. See it? it? See it spinning up? Yep. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Look at that spinning up there. Right, right, right there. in front of you. Clouds gathering over Lake Michigan. And passengers left stranded at Chicago O'Hare. It's part of the extreme weather coast to coast. For more than 100 million Americans, it's already a scorching summer, with oppressive heat gripping much of the south and southwest. It's 100 and too many. A heat dome is responsible for consecutive days of record triple-digit temps, testing the limits of first responders. In Phoenix, firefighters are bracing for a sweltering 115-degree day, marking two weeks at or above 110. We have deaths inside of homes within the city of Phoenix, and to us, that's just unacceptable. The inside of Maria Larumbe Cruz's trailer feels like an oven. You spend all day here. This room, cooled by an air conditioning unit, is her only refuge. But she says it's a struggle to pay her monthly bill. California, Texas, and Florida are also hitting record-setting highs. Residents doing what they can to stay safe and cool. We are taking uh, breaks as much as possible in the air conditioning. El Paso is expected to continue its hot streak with a record 28 days at 100 degrees or hotter, while Miami hit a record high at 97 degrees, with a heat index over 100 for 31 days and counting. With extreme heat not considered a FEMA disaster, states are left to fend for themselves, something politicians on both sides of the aisle want to change. It's a national problem. 
The push for help coming as the whole country weathers a summer of baking heat and intense storms. Our thanks to Aaron McLaughlin for that report. Well, now let's get to NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren in Vermont, where they are cleaning up from this historic flooding earlier this week. It looks like by the hood it might be raining again there. Hi, Kristen. Good morning. Hey, Savannah. Yeah, the hood just went up. We're just getting a little bit of drizzle at this point, but it could get much more severe as we go through the day. We're here in Hardwick at the Inn by the River, and this, for me, may be one of the most enduring images of this storm. Take a look at this hotel. Half of it just washed away by the river. And this isn't just a hotel. This was somebody's dream. The owners bought this. They fixed it up. This was going to be their retirement. And now it is a total loss. Residents in Vermont bracing for more heavy rain today as the state's governor urges everyone to stay vigilant. This may not be over with rain in the forecast and nowhere for it to go we could see waters rise again. FEMA helping organize disaster efforts with the National Guard ready to mobilize if there's more flooding. There's staging in locations to be ready and prepared to respond. As widespread devastation from the catastrophic flooding sets in for so many living here. What is it like to come home to find this? It's devastating, absolutely devastating. I, I, I have no words, we just need help. That desperation echoed in towns across the state, with lifetimes of memories now irreparably damaged in just days. We're going to lose the stuff that means the most to us. But we have our cats and we have each other. Murky floodwaters still filling many streets. Others lined with piles of debris and mud as residents start assessing the damage. What do you do? I mean, scrape it up. Where do you put it? It's a long road ahead for business owners in downtown Montpelier. It's a big mess. But local officials are now cautiously optimistic as the Wrightsville Dam and other state rivers have started to recede. All rivers are expected to be below flood stage within the next 24 hours. And communities begin to rebuild. We will definitely come back from this. And so... And so as you look at the damage here, you can also see how far the river has fallen from all the way, you know, up here on the banks down. And so that really is the hope as we go through the next couple of days here, that they have fallen enough, that the rivers and tributaries have enough room for that new water to go to. Joe? Kristen, hey, Kristen, it's Savannah. What a dramatic image with that in behind you. Just heartbreaking to see. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. A murder suspect is in custody this morning after police in Tennessee say he fatally shot a well-respected hand surgeon at an orthopedic clinic where he worked. Police are calling the shooting a targeted attack. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now from Collierville, Tennessee with the latest. Blaine, good morning. Well, Joe, good morning to you. That suspect is set to go before a judge later this morning. Right now, he's being held right here on a $1.2 million bond. Now, police are still investigating this entire incident, but they say so far, it appears the shooter had one suspect, one focus rather, his doctor. At a doctor's clinic just outside of Memphis, the emergency calls came within moments. We're in the uh, northwest corner building room C2, C2, Charlie 2. Jimmy doctor down two rounds, looks like to the chest. When police arrived, they found Dr. Benjamin Mock shot several times, killed in his own exam room. The shooter, police say, was his patient, 29-year-old Larry Pickens, arrested within minutes just outside the building. He was armed. Uh, he was not carrying the gun to use it, but he had it on his person. Police say Pickens had been in the office for several hours and that he was there to be treated. According to an affidavit obtained by NBC affiliate station WMC, a nurse recognized Pickens from previous visits to the clinic. She says she was inside the room where Pickens was being treated and saw him remove a pistol from his waistband and fire three rounds at Dr. Mock. Was he targeting this doctor specifically? What we know is that the, that it was a one-on-one -on -one confrontation. He didn't attempt to shoot anyone else that we're aware of at this point. Once he shot the, uh, the doctor, then he left the building. Mock was recently featured in Memphis Magazine as one of the city's top doctors. A prominent orthopedic surgeon, he specialized in hand and wrist surgery. 
Just last you know, week, he spoke safe. with our affiliate about firework safety. If any kid's hand saved, in my standbook, standpoint, it's worth it. Mock also served at a local children's hospital. In an email to employees, the hospital's interim president writes, Ben was a friend to so many of us, a beloved colleague and a dedicated physician to so many patients. Evelyn Mitchell Irby was one of those patients. She received two hand surgeries from Dr. Mock. He was an amazing person and this world will definitely, definitely be different without him. It will, he will definitely be missed. Now, in addition to serving the community, Dr. Mock is being remembered as a loving husband and a father. In fact, everyone we spoke to stressed just how dedicated he was to his family. Now, as for that suspect, he's facing charges of first degree murder and aggravated assault. Joe. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. Well, disgraced actor Kevin Spacey is back in a London courtroom today as the sexual assault trial against him continues. The former Hollywood superstar is facing 12 charges, including sexual and indecent assault and causing a person to engage in penetrative sexual activity without consent. The four victims in the case say the alleged incidents happened between 2001 and 2013. Now, Spacey has pleaded not guilty and denies all charges if convicted, Spacey will likely face jail time. NBC News correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us from outside the court in London with more on today's trial. Hey, Ali, good morning. So I understand that the prosecution just wrapped up its case yesterday. Tell us the details the jury heard from that side. Hi, good morning, Savannah. That's right. The prosecution finished its uh, closing arguments uh, yesterday, and they heard from uh, the accusers. And uh, they painted a very sordid picture of Kevin Spacey, this uh, Hollywood uh, star, uh, calling him a vile sexual predator, uh, one of the accusers that can't be named for legal reasons, an aspiring actor, said that he had contacted Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey had got in touch with him. He met up with Kevin Spacey, went to his flat, uh, smoked marijuana with him, and then he alleges that Kevin Spacey had uh, drugged him, that he passed out, only to wake up a few hours later to find Kevin Spacey performing oral sex on him. He said the whole experience was deeply traumatizing and has changed his life. We heard from somebody else who said that they were in a car with Kevin Spacey when Kevin Spacey suddenly violently grabbed his uh, genitals, uh, saying that the car almost uh, swerved off the road and, and crashed. Uh, so these are some very serious allegations that have been made against uh, Kevin Spacey, but he's in court today uh, defending himself. He's saying that all of these uh, accusations that are being made against him are either not true or the sexual relations he had with people were consensual. Um, so it's really going to boil down to who the jury believes, the people that are accusing him or Kevin Spacey. So, Ali, I know that the defense, as you're saying, starts presenting its case today. First, do we know how long that's going to take or what we're going to hear and any chance of actually hearing from Spacey? Well, yeah, that's right. The defense started today. The prosecution took about two weeks, so it would be fair to assume that the defense will probably take the same amount of time. And yes, Kevin Spacey showed up today. This is the first time he's giving evidence. He's in the dock, which is a glass box in the middle of the courtroom. And he seemed very relaxed, Savannah. He came in, he joked with the court guard, he sat down, he seemed calm. Uh, he started giving uh, evidence. He spoke about his time here in London and how, how he such an anglophile and how he was so committed to the theater, the old Vic that he was working at. So he's obviously trying to gain some sort of rapport with the mm -hmm. jury. Uh, and this will go on for the next couple of weeks. And Ali, what sort of prison term would Spacey face if he's found guilty? Well, on the lesser charges, he could get away with a very heavy fine. But that very serious charge of causing somebody to engage in sexual penetration without consent, that's, that could hold a 19-year prison sentence. So that's the most serious one. And I guess, you know, that's what the prosecution is more focused on. And this is what Kevin Spacey is saying, that this was just all consensual. All right. Ali Aruzi, thank you so much. Coming up later this hour on Morning News Now, our chat with a talented writer, actor, and musician who's flipping the script by bringing gender fluidity to your streaming screen. Stick around for my conversation with Nico Tortorella. But first, it's not just the U.S. that's dealing with an unrelenting heat wave. Europe also experiencing sky-high temperatures that could soon break records. We'll take you there.
Welcome back. As we've been talking about all morning, millions of Americans are suffering through extreme heat here in America. But we're not the only ones dealing with high temperatures. Europe is once again seeing a heat wave of its own this summer. NBC's Claudio Lavanga has more on that from Rome. Well, Italian meteorologists have got this bad habit of giving scary names to heat waves. Well, this time it's called Cerberus, like the three-headed monster featured in Dante's Inferno. Now, I don't know how hot Dante imagined his inferno to be, but this is uh, quite close. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Uh, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning here in Rome, and it's already uh, over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's bound to be uh, to get worse, of course, and the humidity doesn't help. It, it feels even uh, warmer. Later in the week, uh, the forecast is that the temperature will reach um, something like 114 uh, degrees. Now, the Rome is one of the uh, 10 cities across uh, Italy um, that is on high heat alert. That means that the vulnerable people like the uh, elderly are advised to stay home in the hottest hours of the say, of the day uh, just uh, stay away from uh, the sun and they should take that warning seriously because at least according to a report published on nature magazine there were 18,000 people who died in Italy alone last year because of the heat that is the highest death toll in the whole of Europe this year we already have the first confirmed victim is a 44 year old uh, worker who was uh, painting zebra crossings on the street when he collapsed because of the heat and then he later died. Of course, Italy is not the only country in Europe that is uh, uh, suffering from the heat wave. Uh, Spain and Greece are reporting similar uh, temperatures with Greece uh, even uh, banning access to uh, nat nature reserves and forests to uh, prevent wildfires and opening up public buildings, uh, air conditioned public buildings, uh, so that people uh, can find, can find uh, some shelter from the heat. In the meantime, here in Rome, people are cooling down by uh, going to uh, get some water from the water fountains dotted all across uh, the city. Uh, but not every city in Europe, of course, has the advantage of uh, water fountains that are free and accessible to people. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. From Europe to here in the U.S., all this extreme heat is not just creating dangerous conditions for people. It's also having a big impact on the crops, farmers' plan, and ultimately the food you put on your table. Alexis Rosellis joins us now. He's an associate professor of agroecology at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Alexis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So tell us, what challenges are farmers facing? How is the heat impacting crops this year? And then, and then you know, obviously down the line, what does that mean for consumers? Uh, well, you know, heat is one of those things that is a uh, factor um, that plants and humans have to deal with. We heard from you there that um, heat will so do plants. And one of the strategies that they that plants have to deal with heat is to use more water. And so um, this is one of the big challenges is farmers often who deal with extreme heat don't necessarily have access to uh, water. Um, and have different ways of dealing with that heat, uh, the plants and the crops suffer. So a lot of farmers are seeing decreased yields because of uh, the increasing heat um, and the decreasing access to water. You know, Professor, farming is a difficult business. Growing seasons are unpredictable. So how do farmers adapt when there's a heat wave like this one that we're seeing in the south and the southwest? Well, you know, some farmers are uh, like the farmers here in Texas are kind of used to extreme heat, but it's really hard to prepare a really prolonged period than unusual extreme heat, right? So the extra 10 degrees uh, uh, temperature is something that's very difficult to prepare for. Sometimes you just got to keep your fingers crossed and pray for rain. On the other end of the spectrum, rather than just extreme heat, we also see things like heavy rain that can also impact farmers' crops. In fact, in India, we know that they're going through this tomato crisis specifically because of that type of weather there. How does that ultimately impact the availability of tomatoes and the prices that we're going to pay here in the U.S.? Well, you know, we, we have a global market. Um, you know, tomato farmers in India have the same challenges that tomato farmers in the United States do. Uh, there's just a certain threshold that some plants have. Um, and when you exceed that threshold, they suffer. Uh, and of course, when you have a decreasing supply all around the country and the world, uh, the prices go up. 
And uh, so, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that India is having those challenges. Um, we have in the United States and uh, the prices all around the world will go up because of, of the way we trade our food. All right. Alexis Rosales, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up, no, nope, it's not you yet. There's still no winner to that estimated $875 million Powerball fortune. We've got your odds of taking home one of America's largest jackpots ever after the break. But first, it's definitely shaking up the world of modern medicine. But is artificial intelligence as intelligent as we think it is? We will take you behind the tech after this. We're back now with our ongoing series, AI Revolution. Today, we're taking a look at how artificial intelligence is shaking up the healthcare world. One study even finds that AI may have better bedside manners than some doctors. I definitely believe that. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward is here with more on this. And Jake, I love talking about some of the medical applications. It seems like one of these things that can maybe give us more hope than fear yeah. when it comes to AI. Good to see you. Hi. Yeah, good to see you as well. You know, it is a, a great use of AI. I mean, the potential for medical breakthroughs using AI is staggering. And we are already seeing it in action across all sorts of specialties, from skin cancer detection, to stroke treatment, to heart failure. But as as with every area AI is used in, there is, of course, plenty of misinformation out there, even as the technology improves by leaps and bounds. As artificial intelligence begins to reshape everything from schoolwork to art, it's poised to transform your visit to the doctor, too. I can attach the smartphone here oh, wow. and then capture a picture. You can see how... In Stanford's dermatology clinic, doctors are testing new AI technology that can help spot skin cancer. In a future iteration of this, it would, in theory, give you back a result pretty quickly? Exactly, within seconds. The technology is already in use in the UK, where its maker, Skin Analytics, okay. says it has detected 99% of the cancers it's seen in the last year. In the U.S., it's now awaiting FDA approval. Dr. Roberto Novoa, who is testing the system at Stanford, points out the need for something like this is enormous. Across the country, there are extremely long wait periods for dermatologists ranging from three months to six months, seven months. And so in theory, there is tremendous need for either more dermatologists or, in this case, maybe a technology that, that helps fill in for the lack of them. We see thousands of cases in a year, and it's always in the back of my mind, what am I missing? But Dr. Novoa says it's not clear yet whether we can trust this system in all cases. I want to see it on a variety of different skin types. We have good evidence showing that these algorithms can underperform in skin of color. They might miss cancer in a non-white patient. Exactly. A work in progress in some clinics, but the rush to work AI into medical care is on. At the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, an AI algorithm analyzes CAT scan images and points doctors to the trouble spots in the brains of stroke victims. This CAT scan and automated AI technology will show you exactly that map of brain area at risk down to the pixel uh, level. Dr. David Freeman says it saved time and brain cells for 28-year-old Raymond Rowe, who came in unable to move one side of his body. What the AI was able to do with the CAT scan information is very rapidly save at least 15 minutes of time and to equate that for every minute in stroke, it's 1.9 million neurons lost per minute. Raymond is now fully recovered thanks to that quick treatment. I have a lot more appreciation towards them and a lot more trust in technology now because if they, if you would have told me if I never had a stroke, you would have told me you're going to let AI work on you, my answer is like no. At Cincinnati Children's Hospital, AI predicts signs of mental crisis in young people. And researchers at the Mayo Clinic use AI to detect early signs of heart failure using an electrocardiogram on an Apple Watch. But while AI could make all sorts of medical breakthroughs possible, there's a lot of misinformation you got to watch out for. ChatGPT often makes things up, even though it sounds like an expert. Even the researchers at the cutting edge of AI technology say it is still a tool, not a replacement for human medical expertise. I don't see this technology replacing doctors. Really, the great power in this is we're helping augment their abilities naturally to help the patient. And with AI chatbots growing increasingly popular, we should say here that companies like Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI all do acknowledge that their chatbots can make things up, but they are working to fix the so-called hallucinations. Oh, well, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Like I said in the intro, it's good to hear a good news for the most part AI story. A really in terms interesting of really application of a, of a statistical yeah. pattern recognition yeah. system.
And you're the one who knows also all the bad things. So you tell us <laughs> yeah, good things. One. I'm into this. Yay. I like this one. I like this one. <laughs> all right, Thank you, Jake guys. Ward. Thank you so much. Great to have you on set. Well, if you are starting your morning today by checking your Powerball lottery ticket, I'm sorry if we're the first faces you're seeing, and I'm now the bearer of bad news that you did not win the jackpot. It's not because <laughs> we looked at your ticket at home. We just know no one won. No one matched all six numbers in last night's $746 million drawing. That means the next drawing, it's Saturday night. It's now skyrocketed to an estimated $875 million. Wow. And not to be outdone, you got Friday's Mega Millions jackpot. That one's worth a mere $560 yeah. million. Don't even buy a ticket for that yeah, one. Yeah, NBC News correspondent <laughs> Emily Aketa joins us now from a bodega here in New York. Emily, so what is the mood like at the convenience store? Are folks excited to play again Friday and Saturday? Yeah, absolutely. They have options here. This place is buzzing with excitement, so much excitement that people literally started buying tickets here at 4 a.m. this morning. And I'm going to be among those testing my luck. Two dollars to get a Powerball ticket. My friend Ken here is going to help me out. One Powerball ticket, please. And we're going to do quick, uh, quick pick. So essentially, I'm not really doing any work on my part. But keep in mind, this is the third. Thank you, Ken. Uh, this is the third largest Powerball jackpot prize in history. We saw the largest one last year at around two billion dollars before that in 2016 around one and a half billion dollars and as you mentioned the next drawing is on saturday but before that we've got the mega millions for cool 560 million dollars guys i will be playing both this weekend so if i don't show up to work on monday you'll know why yeah i love when everybody's like then i'm gonna quit <laughs> <laughs> and then we all know who won um Emily, just remind us of the odds here though yeah, the odds are not ever in your favor. One in 292 million. In other words, you are more likely to compete in the Olympics, to get attacked by a grizzly bear, to get struck by lightning, to become president of the United States. Now, that's for the $875 million prize. There are actually nine different ways you can win with this ticket because of a number of different number variations. For instance, last night we saw someone win in Florida and someone win in Indiana, $1 million each because they matched five Powerball numbers. So there are other options if you don't get everything don't just count yourself out check for all of the other options because you could win some money i should note real quickly i'm not going to be here on monday and putting that out there now it's not because i want so don't it's, start calling joe right. to donate to your charity i'm actually off on monday we'll so show just, up at your doorstep just, yeah just don't i didn't to know that either, so good to know, <laughs> good to know. Heads up. emily we love this question what are some of the fun creative examples of all the things you can do if you're the lucky winner that's the most fun question because you really can get creative. So let's start over here. We've got lollipops here, 50 cents a piece. So that means you can get one and a half billion lollipops if that's to your liking. I was looking at tickets last night. Beyonce was in Philadelphia. Some of the premier seats were going for $8,500 each. You could invite just 100,000 of your friends to Queen Bee's concerts. And then since we're in New York City, the most expensive apartment listing in the country is here near Central Park. You could buy that more than three times over Central Park Tower, the penthouse there, aptly named on Billionaire's Row. So talk about high living. Guys. Yeah, but isn't that the one that's like very, isn't very, that where very you high in? up? You right, live on right. Park. I do live on Central Park, but not on Billionaire's He's Row. Not There's a lot of to it, Emily, that was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, inflation might finally be cooling off, but that's unfortunately not enough for many Americans. Yeah, we're seeing more and more people turning to those buy now, pay later apps to help pay for essentials like groceries. We've got the pros and cons of that next on Morning News Now. We're back now with a surprising new trend among Americans at the grocery store. Yeah, according to Adobe Analytics, the number of people using those buy now, pay later types of programs to buy their groceries went up 40% in the first two months of this year. And experts say that number could get even higher during back to school season, which, spoiler alert, is just next month already. Let's bring in Jennifer Streaks for more on this. She's a senior personal finance reporter and spokesperson for the personal finance vertical at Business Insider. Jennifer, good to have you with us. So let's talk big picture here. We know inflation has been coming down steadily in the past year. We got good numbers just yesterday on this, but I mean, this does seem to indicate that people are still sort of feeling the pain here if relying on these kind of buy now, pay later things. Definitely. I mean, inflation is coming down, but we're not seeing it immediately in the grocery store yet or at the gas pump. And so people are getting creative now in terms of how they're going to make ends meet on just their daily needs and essentials. So we know these installments, they're convenient, they're certainly popular, but there are some serious downsides to using them. Can you talk about what some of those are? 
Definitely. I think it's really easy to get into debt with these services because right now they're not communicating with each other. You could have a one with Klarna or one with the firm or one with Afterpay and you owe on all of those on each and every one. And so it's easy to get into debt because the sign up is pretty easy as well. There isn't a huge credit requirement. Uh, you don't build credit history with that because they only tend to report if you are late. And the main thing is the debt, the potential to get into high debt with these mm -hmm. services. Absolutely. So what advice do you have for people who might be relying on these apps or maybe they've gotten pretty used to thinking like, hey, this is an easy way to be able to pay what I feel comfortable with right now. What's your advice? I think that they should really think about revamping their budget really trying to understand why this money is just not, especially for groceries. Why is it that you don't have money for groceries? Because that's a pretty essential item before you get into afterpay as a service or as a natural thing. Because I think that people are seeing this as just enhanced layaway. And most of the time, mm -hmm. you only have to pay it in four payments. So it's easy in your mind, oh, it's only four payments. There's no interest. It's not like a credit card. But if you start racking this up and make this just a part of your financial plan, the next thing you're going to see is that you're in debt. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good point, especially because I think you're right. No interest. People think, hey, no big deal, no problem. But it could ultimately Correct. add up to an issue later. Jennifer Streaks, thanks very much. Thank you. More financial headlines now. Bob Iger will be sticking with Disney as its CEO for at least a little while longer. On his round two in that role, CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with that another news. Hey, Pippa. Hey, Savannah. Well, Disney's board is extending CEO Bob Iger's contract by two years through 2026. Iger returned last November, less than a year after he retired, after his hand-picked successor Bob Chapek was pushed out. He vowed to stay for two years to restore the business. Iger faces multiple challenges, including a decline in TV audiences, weak performances at the box office, and a streaming business that continues to lose money. Meantime, Google is adding new features to its barred AI chatbot, including the ability to speak its answers and respond to prompts that include images. Spoken responses are available in more than 40 languages. Google is also introducing a few other features, such as the ability to pin and rename conversations, share responses with your friends, and change the tone and style of responses you get back from Bard. And Chipotle's newest automation effort could potentially squeeze more green out of its avocados. The burrito chain is working with a company called Vibu on a prototype that can cut, core, and peel avocados before they're mashed by hand into guacamole. Chipotle says the automated process could potentially reduce guac prep time in half. That could let employees devote more time to other public-facing areas. Joe and Savannah, back to you. Where can I get one of these things? <laughs> <laughs> Is that like... <laughs> right? For, yeah, for your kitchen? Exactly. Right next to your air fryer? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Blender. now I'm totally having to pull a for lunch. So thanks very right. much for that, Pippa. Pippa, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, coming up, we will end the hour with the latest addition to our Flipping the Script family, Nico Tortorella. That's right, a true triple threat, acting, writing, musician. We're going to talk about bringing gender fluidity to your screen. Our chat coming up next. Good to have you back with us. Well, the SVs took place yesterday, and there was one particularly emotional moment. The Buffalo Bills' DeMar Hamlin took the stage to honor the medical professionals that helped save his life back in January. Of course, you probably remember Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest after making a tackle. But since then, he has made an absolutely remarkable recovery. Thanks to his treatment. The football player presented Bill's training staff with the Pat Tillman Award for service. Also last night at the Dolby Theater, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes won Best Athlete for Men's Sports. And then skier Michaela Schifrin, she was named Best Athlete Women's Sports. She's a friend of the show. We've had her here before a couple times, actually. I've gotten to talk to her. She is just the best. So happy for her. And love to see that. She had kind of a difficult time in her career, which she's very open about. Yeah. And then has just totally come back in such an incredible way, especially also after losing her father. It's just so great to see. It's so great to see. She's such a warrior. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. Finally, this hour, our series Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. This morning, we are talking with Nico Tortorella, a musician, author, and actor who identifies as gender fluid. You may have seen Tortorella in two seasons of AMC's The Walking Dead, World Beyond, or Apple TV's City on Fire. Nico joins us now to talk about 
life, career, and exciting new project. You are busy, my goodness. Yeah, I keep busy. We <laughs> like, with flipping the script, we want to talk about diversity in yeah. Hollywood. For folks here, gender fluid, they may go, I don't get that. What does that mean? Mm. What's the best way you describe it for folks? I wish there was one specific answer to that question. Uh, I will just say our my relationship to gender isn't fixed. It's not just one thing. Um, it's definitely become a conversation that has become super politicized in the world, right? And our my relationship to gender is mine, and uh, that's what it is. You, it's, it was even complicated for you with your family. You often talk about Still it, is. and I love it. Is <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, I mean, I, I love reading about the evolution with your mother, and, and talk a little bit about that. What you experienced when you were younger, and how you can change hearts and minds by having these conversations. Yeah. Um, we all have stories and places that we come from. And as the world continues to change around us, hopefully we are continuing to evolve as well, right? If we're not, if we're not growing, we're not truly living. And I think that uh, <laughs> there, there are always resources available to you outside of your home. Um, if, if anyone is like going through it, I would just seek community in any, any which way. It, you, does, it doesn't always get better either. There's this, you know, saying it, it there gets is a better, saying it gets right? better. Yeah. Um, we have the power to become better people, uh, but the circumstance doesn't always get better. You wrote a book called Space Between a few years ago, addressing it to this. What does Space Between even mean? Mm. And what was it you hope the main message of the book? Yeah, um, my approach to these conversations has always seemed a little bit more poetic, maybe. Um, I really use gender as a metaphor for something so much larger, these binaries that exist in the world. The world has never been more divided. This country has never been more divided. My goal is to uh, explore the space between two ends of spectrums. Uh, these binaries that exist are everywhere, right? And I'm curious uh, to explore the space that potentially brings us all a little bit closer rather than farther apart. You have a movie that is going to be premiering, screening at Outfest later this month, The Mattachine Family. Yeah. Tell me about this one. Yeah, it's a really uh, special story um, about creating life in a time when life is the most fragile. Uh, Thomas, who I play in The Mattachine Family, uh, is a dad. He was a foster parent, uh, him and his partner. Uh, had a foster child for a few years. Uh, they wind up lo uh, losing their foster child uh, at the top of the movie, and the rest of the film is him just trying to figure out how to become a parent again. Uh, and I, I actually shot that movie while uh, I was experiencing our own infertility journey, uh, which was super intense and beautiful to be able to just have that life imitating art. And uh, yeah, it's a really special movie. We have about 30 seconds left cool. here to talk about your own journey. Yeah. You now have your first child. Talk about that experience. Yeah, it's it's really the best thing uh, that that I've ever experienced. You know, our our relationship to gender has even changed just after becoming a parent. You know, we experienced infertility for a couple years. We were forced to examine our own biologies and our bodies, and then we had a baby at home, which was just like the most magical experience. And now we're raising this little person that has a soul and a body and a spirit, and it's just it's continuously moving our relationship to our own gender forward and it's it's changed everything about who I am and the world around me. Congratulations. Thank Nico you. Nico Tortorella, a great time for you in your life. Thank you for taking some it. time to chat with us. We appreciate totally, it. Totally, totally. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.